Um, we are going to start with the minutes from our prior meeting. Um, have people had enough time to review them or should we take them up at the next meeting? I will move them because oh, I read them. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else want a second? Okay, Barbara, thank you. Um, I guess we have to do a roll call vote. Um, Helen? Yes. Susan? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And myself vote yes, so thank you for for that. I appreciate it. I know Robin appreciates it when we get our minutes done. So thank you, Robin. Um, today we are having a presentation and updates to curriculum and uh, beginning a conversation about essential curriculum. And Michelle Herman is here. Um, if everyone on, on um, maybe the staff side, um, since we all just roll called our names as well as members of the curriculum subcommittee of the school committee, perhaps everyone could just go around and introduce themselves and their role. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle. So I'm Gabe McCormick, Curriculum Coordinator for Social Studies K through eight. Good to see you all. Hi, I am Tanya Alvarado. I'm the K-8 World Language Curriculum Coordinator. Hi, I'm Emily Speck. I'm the um, K-8 to Science Curriculum Coordinator. Uh, I'm on the phone temporarily, but once I drop my son off, I'll get back on the computer. <laughs> Joanna, you want to introduce yourself? Yep, I'm Joanna. I'm the K-8 ELA coordinator. You too. I know. Oh, me. I, I'm Michelle Herman, and I am currently the Senior Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Great, thank you to everyone for um, introducing themselves, and thank you for joining us at four o'clock on a Tuesday. We appreciate your um, extra time in this very, very busy year. Um, and I see that um, Suzanne Federspiel has also joined us um, for our meeting. So we were just making introductions, Suzanne, and Michelle is going to lead us into our conversation today. Great, and um, <clears throat> Carlin just joined us and she is the curriculum coordinator for wellness and health, and she's frozen. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. Um, <clears throat> so we know that you like to structure these meetings as a discussion, um, and we wanna give you an opportunity to do that, but we're, what we wanna do is sort of lay some groundwork and then come back to the discussion piece. And so if that works and that's okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And let's see, uh, here we go. And can you see that? And if I get to, let's see, review, present. All right. So we wanted to start out today just talking about um, a quick overview of like the curriculum development and the history that's taken place in Brookline and share really what we've learned as we've moved along and then talk about the next steps in articulating the Brookline curriculum. And we called it a Brookline curriculum is we want to make sure that people really know that we want the teachers in the school district to have ownership of this. This is not an office of teaching and learning only project. So wanted to make that super clear. In addition, um, we want to say that the work that's been done till now through the, throughout the district still has stands and has its merits. It's just that there are things that we're learning and we're learning about student learning and we're learning about best, way, best practices that are um, giving us pause and thinking about what is the next step to continuing this really strong Brookline program. So um, I put this in there, this is the mission of the district and I underlined three specific words. And so I'll give you a second to just read it. And what you'll notice is that we underlined succeed in a diverse and evolving global society. So if you think about our students that are in kindergarten right now, and um, I think we determined that they would uh, graduate in 2032, we don't know what the world will look like in 2032. Just like students who were in kindergarten in 1960 didn't have any idea that at this point in time, we'd all be walking around with cell phones, driving electric cars, that, that just wasn't in the purview of what was going on. And so we wanna make sure that as we're thinking about what we put in front of students that we're preparing them for this world that we just can't envision as of now. 
And I'm going to pause for one second. I just want you to know that we've brought the whole team with us or much of the team with us today because this is a joint effort and all of this work has been done jointly with this team and then them with their teachers. So I wanted to make sure that they were here and able to have voice when needed. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. So this is a, a quote, I think I've used it before at school committee meetings. It talks about ensuring a, an essential curriculum for all students and access to grade level curriculum. We, for this evolving world that I just talked about, the one that we have no idea what it's going to be in the future, um, we want to give students need the opportunities to engage in the in the content that will allow them to be prepared for that. And one of the things that we talk about in equity is that all students have access to the grade level grade level content. Um, and it's just sort of that reminder of why it has to be sort of a codified in a structured piece of work. So here's our sort of little history tour. So I put pre-COVID and, and the reason that we used pre-COVID is that that kind of marks all time before March. So what happened in the district in the last multiple years before March? So we had learning expectations that the school committee voted on. Teachers had autonomy at the time to create the, all the lessons that went with those learning expectations. A few, about a year and a half ago, or maybe even two years ago, there was the beginning of the reimagining the essential curriculum. And that began with the portrait of the graduate work. And in the portrait of the graduate, which we'll look at, there were some skills that people identified that were super important values to be working with students on. And then there were more, we realized there were more learning expectations than could possibly be taught. And teachers sort of made their own choices about which ones they did or didn't teach. So what we learned from that was that it might be part of the factor as we dig back in our achievement gap for students. And also that many of our, our essential learning expectations, they need updating because what we learned from the portrait of graduate, which again, I will show you in a few minutes, is that we didn't have quite the right balance of critical thinking skills and knowledge skills. And we'll, we'll get a little deeper into what that means. So then COVID hit and everything kind of, you know, threw a wrench in it. As I was talking about not being prepared for the skills of the future, we as teachers weren't prepared for the skills we needed during the initial COVID shutdown. So one great thing that we saw that came out of that was teacher collaboration. It increased immediately in order for teachers to sort of survive the moment. We also received mixed messages from DESI about the amount of content that had to be taught, the amount of time on learning, which really, it made it hard. We also, as a team, decided that we needed to narrow the learning expectations for people because there were some key things that students needed to move on to the next year. And then there was also the birth of the RLA during the summer. And we had teachers coming together who had had all these varied experiences based on um, the, sort of the things I talked about in the pre-COVID era. And so that led us to finding out some really interesting pieces of data and facts. Students movement throughout the district. So when we created the RLA, students came together from all over the district and multiple programs. And so they'd had different experiences. The um, pandemic excel itself brought the schools into people's homes. So instruction became super, super um, highlighted and, and everybody, it was very much like parents and students were all part of the same classroom as the teachers. And, that, and then what we also started to see once DESE started to hand down some very specific standards that they were asking us to pay attention to that some of our current learning expectations didn't meet those standards. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna just give a little bit more intro and then I'm gonna have Gabe kind of walk us through an example of all of this and where we're going through a social studies um, lens, which it's not just about a social studies lens, this lens and thus the other curriculum coordinators that are here uh, goes to their contents as well. So the portrait of a graduate, we began this work, it is not finished. We have not completed the piece of the public's conversation with us, but this was the conversation with all teachers and staff within the district and the stakeholders there and with students. So what, what evolved from the portrait of the graduate were um, all of these skills that people felt were super important to students. And if you notice, these skills are not knowledge-based. 
if you think about it this way, these skills are the vehicle to get students to the knowledge. So using collaborative collaboration, um, communication, critical thinking and problem solving, that is the vehicle that we wanna teach students to have those skills in order to get to content. And so if you looked at our current, um, our current learning expectations, they didn't quite fit together with these skills. And we'll, again, we're gonna show you sort of an example. So again, this is just sort of the, where we are and where we, where we wanna to get to. And again, like we said, the work that has been done till now throughout the years in Brookline has been great and served our students well. It's just that the world is changing. Um, like I said, if we had known when I was in school a lot of years ago and starting my teaching program that I would need to know how to do run any kind of meeting like this, I would have thought you were nuts. So just keeping that kind of in mind as a lens. So our current learning expectations, they're, they're knowledge and skill based and they're really held separate by content. So social studies has a set, ELA has a set, math has a set. And our current units, they're very thematic based and activity based. So we hear about the Ghana unit, we hear about the birds unit, and we and that's how our how we talk about our instructional units. What we want to sort of continue the shift to is the learning standards. And the learning standards really uh, help us understand what students are expected to know and be able to do at a certain stage in their development. And th they also divide. They also will define the steps that we take for, with students to get to the portrait of the graduate skills. Our course of study, those are where those big ideas come in. So we're not saying we wouldn't have a bird unit. We might have a bird unit, but the learning standards might be seen differently within the unit. So the big ideas would drive how that unit would roll out. And, and the units should include the course, and we could call them courses study because it's, it's a whole trajectory of instruction. What that will do is um, include the evaluation tools and the way to measure student progress towards um, the skill acquisition. The other thing that's super important is that we start to look at things both vertically and horizontally. So how do these skills build for students as they move up? So what I'm gonna do right now is hey. Pass it on. Oh, sorry, Gabe. Go ahead. This one, I think what will be important to consider and remember is that like while I go through the social studies example, different curriculum areas are sort of at different places along this. And so in some curriculum areas, we already see a lot of skill based kind of spiraling standards. And in some curriculum areas like social studies, we don't see a lot of that. So I might be on the more extreme end on the left. Yeah, and I think one of our key pieces is that we want to, um, Gabe, I don't know what happened to this slide, but we want to make sure not only that students get the best experience they can and that they are super prepared for the future, but that if a teacher comes new to us, that they have all the tools in front of them and they can follow the, the practices. Right now, when a new teacher comes to the district, especially at the K-5 level, they have to go through like a set of materials that are social studies, a set of materials that are ELA, a set of materials. We wanna kind of build our muscle around and our, our structure so that all of this is really clear to them. And if somebody walked in and said, where's your essential curriculum or your Brookline curriculum, that we're really clear as to what it is. So I'm gonna pass this on to Gabe to um, continue the conversation. Like he said, he's at the extreme end of things or more extreme end of things. And so our content areas are in different places within this process. So Gabe, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Yeah, so if we can- and just tell me when to switch. I was gonna say, if we can switch so that I can share, it might be easier than- uh, just That is fine with me. All right. Um, yeah, I'll do it from there. Make sure I can see folks. All right. Um, hopefully, everyone's seeing this presenting. Great. Um, sorry. I can't see it. There we go. Um, so, really, um, 
kind of the way I've framed this core issue, and then I'll kind of unpack how we got to this and where we are, um, is that in social studies, the learning expectations really need to more align more closely with the skills and competences we want from the portrait of the graduate. And then um, what I'll be kind of talking about are the state social studies practices from the new framework, and then um, kind of this national C3 framework um, that I'll talk about. So I want to just kind of briefly define some of these terms, right? The learning expectations we should all know, they're the Brookline defined learning expectations. Um, and I believe the last school committee vote and update was in the 2014, 2015 school year. So about five years ago. Um, and then the state framework um, for social studies is relatively new. Um, so it went live for August, 2018 um, and it, some grade levels had a really significant adjustment to them. Um, some grade levels were left relatively the same. Uh, most of the, what I'll be talking about uh, today is gonna be using grade four as an example, which is just sort of arbitrary. Um, but a kind of an example that's illustrative is in grade five, which is a US history year, the state just tacked on 100 years of US history to the end of the course without taking anything away from what teachers are supposed to teach. Um, so it took an already massive class and added a bunch to it. Um, to date, we have not really redesigned our curriculum to align with the new state standards. Um, in some places, I think we're pretty close. In other places, we're pretty far away and there's some good conversation to have there. Um, the third piece though, that I think is really helpful for what we're talking about today is what um, kind of at the national level is referred to as the C3 framework, which is a college career and civic life. Um, and it's a national framework that um, Massachusetts actually has not really signed on to, and I'll kind of talk about some examples with that. But um, one of the nice things that we'll see is that uh, the C3 framework actually puts forward um, some of these critical thinking and um, other skills that kind of align with the portrait of the graduate, and then also gives sort of checkpoints at the end of second grade, the end of fifth grade, the end of eighth grade, and so on. So we can see how a certain skill will kind of spiral up and become more complex as students get older. Um, so I'll be using these terms a lot and just wanna make sure basically the key here is like the learning expectations are local Brookline, the state stuff is obviously at the state level and then the C3 is the national level. Um, so this is a reminder of just the portrait of the graduate, right? And as Michelle said, these are really um, about critical thinking, right? empathy is about how we connect to other people and how we understand the experiences of others. This is not what year was the American Revolution and what were George Washington's key policies as the first president, um, right? These cut across content areas, but a lot of these live really deeply in social studies or can live really deeply if we think about it that way. Gabe, can you put it into present mode? Oh, it, did it not go? It didn't go and it's just how I can see people getting closer to the screen trying to read it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Loading really slowly. There we go. Perfect. Um, yeah, that's where I don't always know what you all see. Um, so that requires communication and a little bit of empathy, right? Um, to make this work. So um, this is these are all of the ELEs for social studies for grade four. Um, I'm not going to like talk through all of them today. I'm going to use are the civics ones and the geography ones for examples today. Um, but I think a um, you know they're divided up into geography, history, civics, and economics, which is like sort of makes sense and in some places doesn't really make as much sense. Um, and what what we see is this is true for first grade through fifth grade. They're all sort of organized the same way. Um, but I think these are good, solid examples of what we see. So like for geography, demonstrate mapping skills concentrating on North America. It's specific in a certain way, but it's also pretty vague. Mapping skills has a lot of different things to it. Um, you know, for civics, uh, which is where I'm gonna start with the detailed examples, um, identifying the political systems of Canada, the United States and Mexico, again, somewhat specific in that fourth grade social studies is really about North America, but identifying the political systems, I could answer that as 
we have a, re a republic in the United States, we have a republic in Mexico, and there's a parliamentary system in Canada. And is that the whole lesson? Right? Um, so there's not a lot of complexity to this necessarily. Um, and part of what I think we experience in Brookline right now is that there are definitely teachers who pour a ton of meaning into this and offer really rich experiences for students. And to kind of use Michelle's example of like the brand new teacher who has zero experience, and we absolutely hire those folks, they may not have the skills and then the curriculum may not push them to do that from day one. Um, and I think we can. And I think we can be in a position where a student who has the brand new novice teacher still has a really rich experience. So um, I'm gonna kind of walk through this example. Um, and this is just to show the different ways we write things versus how these other way, ways of writing things. So again, for fourth grade in civics, identify the political systems of Canada, the United States and Mexico, and then give some examples of the major rights of citizenship um, at the state level, we've added these social studies practices, which are a lot like the math practices or the science practices. Um, and actually, um, as coordinators, we did a, uh, we made a chart that actually aligns them and we can see like, we all say supporting claims with evidence, we just may say it a little differently, for example. Um, but one of the practices from from social studies is demonstrate civic knowledge skills and dispositions. Relaying factual knowledge is not necessarily demonstrating civic skills and dispositions, right? It is demonstrating knowledge, um, but really we're missing a couple other pieces in terms of what we're actually asking folks to do. And then the C3 standard, and this is for the end of fifth grade. So fourth grade is kind of in the middle of this, right? Distinguish the responsibilities and powers of government officials at various levels and branches of government in different times and places. So that is significantly more complex than what we are currently asking our fourth grade students to learn and know how to do. So, you know, I think what Michelle has said about like, we just haven't necessarily reviewed this for a while. I was actually working with a third grade team today and the last curriculum revision for the unit we were looking at was 2011, um, you know, which is actually before the C3 was designed. Uh, so we haven't, we've had some like touch ups here and there in social studies, we haven't had a significant revision um, for quite some time. Uh, just another example, um, so we don't really have an ELE that aligns to this currently, um, but one of the social studies practices, again, that cuts through all grade levels is determine next steps and take informed action as appropriate. Right? So this is really building students activism. and the relevant standard for the C3 would be using deliberative process when making decisions or reaching judgments as a group, right? And so what I think is really promising about, you know, some of the ways the C3 writes the standards is that they move us towards the portrait of the graduate skills we want. If I'm gonna use deliberative processes, I have to communicate with other people. I may have to have empathy for their position and we have to actually engage with each other. Um, if I'm gonna identify the political systems, I don't really have to engage with anyone. And it doesn't really create the kind of student we're, we're saying we want. Um, I'm gonna skip over this because um, I think what's also useful, so these are the same uh, civic examples and what I've done instead of adding the state piece is I'm kind of highlighting what the C3 asks for at the end of second grade compared to what they ask for at the end of fifth grade, right? So by the end of second grade is described roles and responsibilities of people in authority. To me, that's actually closer to what we're currently asking fourth graders to do compared with what I showed before, which is distinguishing the responsibilities and then doing some comparisons. So I think, you know, this is an example of where we have an opportunity to really increase the complexity, increase the critical thinking. Um, and, you know, this is, there's, I could have picked an example from literally any grade level in some ways. Um, and in some cases, these might be small tweaks to curriculum. In some cases, these might be complete redesigns of activities or lessons or assessments, which I'll kind of talk about in a moment. Um, I'm gonna skip over this one to do the geography one because I think it's pretty powerful as well. Um, so again, on the left-hand column are our current ELEs for fourth grade. Um, so even if we just do the bottom uh, row in pink there, so explaining how families express their cultures through celebrations, rituals, and traditions in the past and present. Um, again, the end of second grade standard 
is describe how human activities affect the cultural and environmental characteristics of places. And I can't read this because my screen's over it, of places and regions. Um, and then for the end of fifth grade, right, we have explained how the cultural and environmental characteristics of places change over time. So that's one where it's maybe a little bit more aligned already. Um, but again, I think the difference is it getting at some of these more conceptual ways of presenting the ideas. And then, you know, what you could see is at the six through eight level, and then again at the high school level, these get increasingly complex, which is what I have an example of here. Um, Michelle, I just want to check in like on time and because we had discussed, like I have a lot of options here. Yeah, uh, Jennifer, I'm going to actually kind of toss it to you and see, because we also have talked about the idea that this might be, this, this, this curriculum presentation might be done in pieces. So if you want us to come back and continue on the conversation after we have a conversation now. So I think it would be really helpful actually to check in with the members of the um, subcommittee okay. to see if folks have questions. Um, and I think that might help to sort of direct where the conversation goes from here. So, mm -hmm. um, I can't see everyone at once. Oh, there we go. Now I can. Do are there questions or comments that members of the subcommittee have that they would like to share um, that might help us direct the conversation? Because otherwise, we'll also go into our next steps. So that's uh, Barbara. Did you want to go? And then I saw Helen. Uh, yes, I, I'm just curious because we're looking at history and geography and civics here. And I'm curious how much, how much children are going to know about the actual history and development of the United States by the time they leave middle school, say, or even fourth and fifth grade, because that's always been a part of it at the lower level. And I'm just curious because as I hear this, not that I think there's any problem with it, but I just wonder how that piece is being handled. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, this is actually why I think social studies is a good example because we're sort of at a point of decision in a lot of ways because we haven't really done the work to adjust towards the new state framework. So there's there's a lot of potential here. Um, you know, really first grade to a certain extent, but then really third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade are all essentially United States heavy years. And then eighth grade is also a United States year. Um, so students have a lot of exposure um, and really between the kind of the combination of third grade and fifth grade creates like a US history experience that then gets picked up in eighth grade. And I think the distinction, um, and this is going a little bit ahead, is it's not even about what we're teaching so much as what we're asking students to do with what we teach. And so one of the examples I have is actually a fifth grade example where at the end of our constitution unit, the end of unit assessment that is currently in the portal and is like in the binder I can give to a new teacher, it's essentially a multiple choice and true false quiz. And it's fairly factual. It looks a lot like an MCAS, even though we don't have a social studies MCAS. Um, it's about 13 or 14 questions. An alternate option could be to do something more performance-based, like reenacting a deliberation in the Constitution about whether to include the Bill of Rights. It's a commonly done end of unit sort of culminating activity that brings in a lot more of the skills and abilities we need, we're asking for, but at the same time still requires students to have all the content knowledge about the constitution, about what's in it, about how it was designed, about why people thought different ways. So I don't think it's an either or issue. Did you wanna follow up on that, Barbara? And then after that, we'll go to Helen. Just, just quick. My I think this all sounds very good, but will students have some sense of the historical story of the United States? Why we're here, what happened, what happened to various groups of people, um, what happened over time? Um, I, th I think you need both. I think you need to understand the story as well as all of the uh, the ways the country works, the way the country became, the way it uh, why the why this has why the government has developed this way. So, what about the story? 
Um, I, have, I'm, I have multiple ways to respond to that. And so I'm trying to choose which one I think is most, most relevant here because I think one of the challenges that we experience is we don't have a single story and that different people have had different stories throughout the history of this country. And to get to that level of complexity requires a lifetime's worth of study. We're not gonna do it in a third grade class. We're not gonna do it in a fifth grade class. We're not even gonna do it in 11th grade and we're not gonna do it in AP US history in 11th grade. It is a very complex thing that requires an ongoing experience. And so, of course, I think what's really important is that each individual course and the student's entire experience through 13 years in the district are coherent and they make sense. And that what we talk about in third grade with kind of European arrival and indigenous folks who were here before the Europeans and sort of the early colonies gets picked up in fifth grade when we talk about revolution and the establishment of the country and the first few presidents essentially gets picked up again in eighth grade, gets picked up again in 11th grade. But that's that's in the course design. Like that's that's in how these individual <laughs> units link with each other and continue to, to do it. I mean, that's, that's why what Michelle described as sort of individual units that don't connect don't work. And so we need to make sure that unit one builds into unit two, builds into unit three, builds into year two, and so on. So yeah, so I, just to come back to sort of the, the beginning of where we did the intro, it's it's not also about losing students' ability, uh, knowledge of facts and information. I think it's the vehicles and what we want them to do with it. So it's bringing more analysis. It's bringing more ability to research to the student's experience and having them have more ownership in getting that information. So instead of feeding them information, say, from, you know, a slideshow only, we pose questions to students where they have to, that where we develop their skills to go and get that information. And our current learning expectations speak primarily to the content knowledge, to the actual knowledge and not the skills. And so trying to marry the two um, in order to give a more um, well-rounded experience. Thank you. Um, Helen, did you have a question? I did. I'm gonna go back a little bit to what Ms. Can you hear me well? Mm -hmm. So I'm using these earphones and that should work. <laughs> <clears throat> I've learned a lot this year, um, but um, I, I don't remember having, and maybe I was not at the meeting or something, the conversation about um, uh, what, uh, what's it called? You just used the term. Oh, the portrait of the graduate? Portrait of a graduate. Oh, yep. I did go to the EDCO meeting where it was presented and I thought it was terrific. But then from that, to today, yep. the teachers, it sounds like, have done it. But my understanding from that, it's a community process. It's something that's supposed to happen with everybody. It's a way of bringing community together. Yep. So what happened? So what happened was first sort of the budget experience last year and then the COVID experience. So we had a whole calendar set out of dates and experiences to bring the community together and then lost that complete ability. So when I say we haven't completed the task, we haven't, we hadn't completed the full task. So the way in which the process worked was that we got narrowed down from a very, as you said, you saw the portrait of graduate at EDCO, it's a huge number of skills, I mean, huge. And so it got narrowed down within the educators realm and the student realm. And the next thing to do was to take, so that list that we gave and I showed is still too long. So that's the next piece is to take it and narrow it down more with the public. The issue is, is that basically no matter what, those skills that all pop to the top, all of those are um, practices that, you know, that allow, and all of the skills in the portrait of graduate, but allow for students to learn um, independent, problem solving thinking pieces. So you're absolutely right. And we want to 
we wouldn't want to we wouldn't want to finish this whole process without finishing the public process either but it sort of feels to me like that big universe of possibilities wasn't that something that was supposed to go to the community first then to the the teachers and students and then or am i i'm gonna put that tape because he's here right. Yep. Yeah, I was I was in central office when we were doing that part of things. So um, I I think there's a lot of I, I don't know. I think I think that's where we started, right? Um, so you know when I think it was Nicole um, was here at, when we kind of began the process. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we had an opportunity to kind of like test it out just with the kind of central office teaching and learning folks and see like does this land, right? Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of the next level was brought to kind of the principals and senior leadership to kind of talk through like, again, which of these makes sense kind of like to try out sort of the process of discussing and narrowing and, um, and then myself, Meg, um, Nicole, and Mary um, went kind of school by school and did like essentially staff meeting presentations or Carlin probably would have been teaching at the moment at the time. I was I was in one of those uh presentations it was great it was yeah. facilitated it was a lot of all the everyone got a chance to express their thoughts their opinions what skills they thought would be the most important for the portrait of the graduate so it was they were, they were well facil facilitated school-based sessions with all the teachers and then there were opportunities for students to kind of do this do similar work um but you're right the the kind of larger public community piece hasn't happened um i mean and I would say, in addition to kind of COVID, part of it is the leadership turnover, right? Um, oh, sure. No, no, I, I, I get that. I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I'm just trying to think through the process and how you get buy-in from everybody, well, because I, you know you might get buy-in from some and not from others. I think part of what's not represented in the chart we have here, though, um, that Scott Moore has this data, is the overwhelming nature of like those top three or four um there's really like significant daylight in between the other ones and critical thinking at every school was the highest whether it was beep or the high school mm -hmm. and no i get I, i'm not them? i'm not arguing any of the points what i'm trying to say is i'm worried about the process let's put it that way and i don't usually go into process that much but on this particular one because it is because it is so important we need to get it right. So I guess and if people feel excluded, they'll start to fight back against this, the other piece. There. Well, I think it's been it's been some time since we've had these conversations and staff maybe are we've had you know turnover teachers. Like I I mean it could be time well spent to start that conversation and maybe it starts in the community and then I, I don't know. You know, I think that it's interesting to think about how to structure that. And to think about the process for that. Well, and maybe... they have the portrait of a graduate group does that, can do that for you as a community. They they actually work with communities to do that. I, I assume we have some people in town uh, in our system who can do it also. Yeah. So um, there have been some conversations with the public and other constituent groups, and we would bring Scott Moore in to kind of share that and continue that work. So I don't think it hasn't been to the public at all. I just don't think we had the listening sessions because they were scheduled for last year. And I agree that we we need, I, I think the question is, do we hold off on continuing to move forward with our curriculum or you know until that's completely finished or do we take sort of an advantage and opportunity of some time that we've got during this, you know, as we're rethinking into next year and then mm -hmm. do some tweaking, like you said, because I, I don't disagree at all. And I think, you know, even turnover of the faces on this, like mine, for instance, um, of this team sort of coming into this, um, you know, I, I think Portrait of Graduate is a great thing. And, you know, we want to honor the process. So I think, you know, I think we have to get the full picture, but I do think it's worth continuing the work, but not, and Susan's got her hand raised as well. Although Jennifer, you can call on people. <laughs> no, that's okay. I saw that Suzanne wanted to um, say oh, sorry. That's okay. And then, um, and then Susan, and then um, I had a couple of thoughts. 
Suzanne, did you want to, just because I saw your hand before. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, so this may be a longer conversation than just now, but I know that we struggled uh, before the pandemic uh, with a lot of community input around this notion that, you know, there are subjects and this is really a K to five conversation. Uh, you know, how do we fit them? How do they blend together? So, you know, there was, there was concern at some point that science and social studies were not getting the airtime that, that people thought they should have or that they wanted. Uh, and we don't wanna pit, you know, a content area against another content area. However, there are only so many minutes in a day. And so I'm just wondering what the thinking is around um, how do we get our kids, our students exposed to all that we want them to be exposed to and yet still have time in the day to um, cover things in the depth we think we should cover them. So that's just kind of what's on my mind right now. I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that, but it is, it is, I, I think it's part of the conversation. It's a pretty heavy um, question. And I think to Suzanne's point, a lot of that was a K-5 conversation because it's not departmentalized. And I think that also creates the greatest amount of fluidity and flexibility with, you know, incorporating, um, you know, language arts with content. Um, and so there's just a lot of, um, a lot of possibilities there. I don't know if somebody wants to speak. Yeah, I think, go ahead, Gabe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll use the fifth grade social studies example because I think it's the most extreme. Um, and actually, Emily and I have talked a lot about how bloated fifth grade is in both of our content areas, um, which creates like the most challenging version of the problem, right? And I think the key is to like, look at what the state is asking us to teach being really honest with ourselves of we're not going to teach it all. Like plain and simple, there is no way a fifth grade teacher is teaching everything the state is asking us to teach in fifth grade. Like that is an impossibility to do it with any thought and any depth. It's actually more than 11th grade US history is asked to teach. So once we can kind of start there, then I think we can look thoughtfully about, okay, which of these topics are repeated? Do they show up already in third grade? Or are they going to show up again in eighth grade? Which topics of these are important or less important to our community? Right. Um, so the content that was added was essentially 1860s to 1960s, which is a ton of really rich but really complex content for fifth graders. And it's something that as I've talked to fifth grade teachers, they actually really want to teach that. They want to teach the expansion of rights. They want to teach how the Civil War fundamentally changed this country and in some ways started to fulfill some of the promises of the Constitution. But right now they feel like they can't because they're teaching this much on the colonies that also sort of shows up in third grade, right? And so that's why even if we wanna to try to get fifth grade kind of on point, we have to also talk about third grade. We also have to talk about eighth grade and we have to start making some trades to say, fifth grade teachers, you're not teaching that colonies unit anymore. I know you love it. I know kids love it. We're pulling that really thoughtfully back into third grade. And so then fifth grade can pick up maybe a little bit later in the story and get to this content that doesn't really show up again, which is sort of that Civil War content. Comes up in eighth grade a little bit. But like, and then we also have to consider like how much time do teachers have to actually get through that so that they can also do right by the fifth grade science. They can also do right by the other content areas. So I have I have a lot of thoughts about that, but um, Susan had her hand up, and so I want to. Give no, her Jen, you should go because I had a different topic. So please just continue on that if that's on the same. Okay. So okay, thank you. Um, I want to really, I like the idea, and I think it is very useful. Um, the idea of horizontal and vertical alignment, and I think that's really important. Um, you know, this idea of looking at when topics come up, how often they spiral, um, you know, and really, really, you know, connect with this idea about reevaluating our learning expectations in the con in the context of and in, in concert with the state frameworks, and that it's been a long time since we've done that work. 
And I think we really need to, to look at that. And I love hearing that people are doing that work. That's great. It's very exciting because I think there are things in science and social studies, I mean, things that just come to the top of my head that I know are the state has said we should be doing this and not all of the units are aligned with that. And, and I, I hear you saying, you know, people love this unit, but it really might actually belong somewhere else at this point. Um, and that's not just, you know, Brookline, it, it's the state as well. And so I think that it's important to really invest the time in the work of figuring out where we are, where we are now, where we need to be and how do we get there and what can we already use that we have that does that. Um, but I, I also really connect with the idea of that it's, it's really, in a lot of ways about what we're asking students to do and how they engage in that work, that they're doing things with more depth and complexity and that they're applying what they know instead of just recalling, um, that that's so important. And I do think that's the part of the portrait of a graduate that comes in, like those are some of those really important pieces. So we've got to manage sort of like our learning expectations slash benchmarks. Um, and then like, how are we teaching that? Right? What's the pedagogy? What are students do? So it's like, what do teachers do? What are students doing? Um, and I love the idea, I mean that, I'm sorry, so when we think about what we're asking students to do, that helps us to structure our instruction once we know what we want them to do. Um, it informs so can I so. just throw something in there because I think you and I have had a conversation about this before. So I think like this all becomes a roadmap. So when you talk about at what we're asking students to do and gave, gave an example before, it's about determining what does it look like when a student is able to do this skill and actually creating some sort of task that provides them that opportunity to demonstrate their ability to do that skill and then working backwards from there. And I think that's that's why I kind of we kind of halted and said, like, this might be a multi multi meeting conversation because I, I think you're right there. Like, it's exactly what Gabe was was talking about when he talked about the difference between what a student can demonstrate to us on a multiple choice test versus what a student can demonstrate to us on either a long-term project or some other way of, of demonstrating understanding or where they're really responsible for the learning is really different. And they, they then bring a different roadmap of instruction to the classroom, so. Yeah, I think that piece about the backwards design, like deciding where we want to be and then designing the instruction and the experiences for students based on what it is that we want them to be successfully able to, to do um, at the end. And I and the only other comment I actually had at this time was that I like the idea of these sort of performance project based assessments because they're much more real world um, than they are. Um, so that then sort of a multiple choice test, which doesn't really, it's very factual. It doesn't have the depth and complexity that students need to have. Um, and I, you know, I guess I refer to those, I think maybe it's the C3 you were talking about, Gabe, uh, like college and career readiness skills. I mean, those are, I think those are very much also entwined with some of the portrait of a graduate stuff. So anyways, that's where in hearing the conversation that you've all been starting to present, that's where my mind is at. Um, Susan, where, what direction did you want to take us in? Uh, not, not too far. Um, you know, first of all, I just, I appreciate this conversation. I know that we're in the middle of trying to do a whole lot of things right now, and, and this is one of them. Um, there are a lot of things we're trying to do. Um, so I guess if I try to tie what's most important in this conversation about a central curriculum to the moment we're in, um, I, don't, I don't disagree conceptually with most of what was said, but just we're in December of 2020. Um, for the next 18 months, we're going to be dealing with the fact that a lot of students, however you define it, don't have critical skills um, that they need to have, be it, and I'm even talking about, you know, state frameworks. I'm talking about like five paragraph essay or analyze claims critically or you know some of that, let alone, I'm, I'm gonna leave social emotional aside for a moment, but, but that's important as well. Um, and so I guess to my mind, there's just sort of a near term 18 to 36 month question of <clears throat> what does it mean to have a third grade education um, in this time and sort of fast forward two years, we're gonna dump all these problems on Josh's desk um, and we're going to say, you know, the fact that there were all, yeah, you ready? Um, you ready with the, he, he's got his catcher's mitt. Oh, okay. good. Um, yeah. So, you know, that th these are all going to sort of come to a head when 
God willing, we're all back, you know, in some format and the, and, and the kids are all over the place, right? I mean, the, whatever distribution curve we had before, it's going to be, and there are going to be huge potholes in it, right? So yeah. I guess what I'm trying to think about is how do we get a, a good enough answer um, now for what does a third grader need to have so that the teachers know it, the parents know it, the kids know it. Um, again, I'm a little bit less worried about frameworks and you know the state standards right now. I'm more worried about like what do we think, what do our educators think? Um, and you know, back in the day, we had you know groups of of educators coming together to create sort of beginning of year, end of year tests just to figure out where kids were. It wasn't like a whole massive standardized test thing. It was that we needed to know for our own instruction um, and and the kids' progression kind of how things were going. Um, and, you know, this, again, this all kind of, we see this all most inequitably in that transition to high school. We've seen it in foreign language. We've seen it in a world language. We've seen it in math. We've seen it in a variety of different places where just the distribution of across the schools and across the kids, it's just, so, 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 and then a lot of things have to happen in ninth grade to, I don't want to say you know, sort of backwards engineer, you know, sort of, or, or I don't say fix, but, you know, reverse deal with the fact all that, all that distribution. So I think being really clear that, that we want to be a place where people want to teach, where they have flexibility, they have autonomy, they have the ability to kind of create fun, new, exciting things um, and, and take risks and try things. Um, and that there's sort of a set of things that we want all kids to be able to get at, at some level or another, right? Some set of consistency, um, because without it, we're actually doing not only the kids a disservice first and foremost, but but our but our educators who are kind of picking them up later on. And so I guess I would like to just sort of think about this conversation in the light of the next, again, 18, 36 months. What is it that would realistically be helpful to kind of get get you all, for you all to get us to as a district um, over that time frame? to solve what we know are, are issues um, that, are, that are getting created even as we speak. We're trying not to create them, but they are. Um, and that we're gonna have to sort of pick up on the other side um, oh. uh, with all these kids. So let me- Yeah, let me there's, there. a, there's a couple of things in there and a couple of things I just wanna put out there. So the latest data did come out from NWEA last week. And one of the really, and I say this should make us all happy, one of the really good things that, that we learned was initially in their initial data that they gathered from students across the United States during COVID, they thought that students would only retain 50% of what they learned in math last year and 70% of what they learned in ELA. On a very, very good note, they have discovered that they were completely wrong and that students have retained a significantly higher portion of their instruction. Now, I forgot that that question might come up tonight, so I didn't write the numbers down. And I... I will get that data back to you because I think it's really important to know that, that I felt a lot better about it. And as I look at instruction in classrooms now, I, I do feel better about the fact that yes, students are moving. Um, and I agree with you, we are using, we are continuing to keep a narrower scope in our instruction right now in order to um, ensure that we aren't sending students off to the next grade. That is gonna take some extra work. Like for example, one of the things that I did just do was purchase some more licenses for things like Dreambox and uh, Lexia so that we can sort of capture some students who might wind up being in the CST or the SIT process who don't necessarily belong there or wouldn't necessarily wind up there, but because of this experience. So I agree 100%, we have to keep our eyes sort of on the prize of now and continuing that. The thing is that what we're talking about right now is not a one year or two year process. So we want to be like in the background, continuing this work and having you know where we're moving to and to be able to put some small things in so that we don't lose sight of it. And I think Gabe, you were gonna, and anybody else, any of the other coordinators? I think, the other really critical piece here is about what we actually want to measure and track. Like, if I want to track whether or not a student can name all the presidents in order, that's a really different task than whether they can disagree with someone and come to a compromise, right? And the, the challenge that, that I personally experience with social studies is we have a lot of learning expectations that are closer to that first example that are factual, that are knowledge-based, that are asking students for recall. And we have a lot fewer that are at students' skills, abilities, ability to analyze 
there's a whole lane of evaluating sources and essentially none of our learning expectations ask about evaluating sources, which is a core social studies skill. And so to Susan, to your point, like I agree with you, but if we're not asking about the right thinking, I sort of don't care about the answer. Right. And so if we're asking about the current learning expectations for me in social studies, I don't think we're asking the right question, but if we ask like, how are students doing on their ability to present a position and defend it? That's a much more compelling question. And so I think that's where some of the disconnect is because if I sort of did an audit of fifth grade classrooms and said, who's doing this kind of complex analysis, they're all going to say no, because we haven't asked them to do that for the last decade plus. And so that would be an unfair question to put on teachers right now. And so it's even COVID or not, because the curriculum is not designed towards that. And so it's a little bit of a chicken and egg challenge. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if we're kind of moving towards what we want to see, and I've had some success already, even you know with small groups of teachers in the summer, for example, where you said like, well, what if we reframe this, right? What if we say like, this is these are the research skills Kid doesn't necessarily have to write a research paper as a fourth grader, but this is what it means to ask a compelling research question. Mm -hmm. This is how I would figure it out and get a couple bullet points for it, right? And then this is how I might write a paragraph. The curriculum wasn't designed for teachers to think about the skills that way. And so we've had mm -hmm. to reframe it, which then requires a bunch of rewriting of what the day-to-day -day lessons look like. Um, and to then Think about how that becomes not just that team I was working with at one school, how that becomes the entire fourth grade. Right? That's a much bigger policy question, I would argue, for an incoming superintendent and deputy superintendent to think about, like, how do you then balance, Susan, what you identified as people's autonomy and creativity with the fact that we want kids to be kind of in the same place at the same time, or mm -hmm. at least know how far away they are from that. So, like, there's a lot of moving parts there that are going to require a lot of investment to make it happen. Yeah, and if I can just jump in, um, I can only see Gabe, I'm on my phone, sorry. Gabe, you can hear me? Okay, I'm gonna assume that the uh, rest of the folks can hear me is um, just to add to that complexity. One of the things that we're finding in special ed is that as students are identified for services, as they make their way towards the high school, we're seeing that students are being pulled out and therefore away from the general education curriculum more and more. And so by the time they get to the high school, you see the differences in um, their skills and what they have been exposed to um, pretty immediately. Um, the fact that we have ninth grade teachers telling us that they can tell um, just by um, sheer content knowledge, what K-8 the kids are coming out of, I think that speaks to the need of the work here um, that we're identifying. And I think you ask a really, really key question, Susan, is this is, I mean, this is moving teaching and learning of the entire district um, and taking into consideration where we are right now, how do we begin to focus ourselves? Uh, a, without a superintendent, a permanent superintendent, but knowing that the work is important and what can we do between now and the beginning of next year. I think that the school committee beginning to start uh, talking about, and Helen has raised this a couple of times already, is how do we think about um, recuperation uh, in the spring over the summer uh, so that we, our kids are better prepared, even more prepared going into the next school year. Are there any other comments? So I'm not sure, Michelle, where you want to head from here. Do you have some thoughts on that? Um, yes. So I think, I mean, we will definitely, you know, turn around and revisit uh, the portrait of graduate uh, next steps and where that goes, because I think it is important not to let that go and that that has to be part of our work and moving forward. And I think we are going to continue um, looking at what we have identified as our learning expectations and where what direction they need to go and, and kind of creating that um, that set of, of standards that we think are important in our next steps. Again, to Susan's point, we are we are continuing to consider like we, what 
what state of affairs we're in right now in terms of the pandemic and the instruction and making sure that we are capturing kids who could fall through the cracks, uh, you know, without having extra work and being at, not work, but extra support and being um, and keeping an eye on that. And I think all of these are kind of a simultaneous piece. And then I think there's there's the other piece, Jennifer, that you brought up is the how we develop it. And I, I, you know, the how we work backwards and kind of identify what students will look like and all of these things tie together. And so I just, I just think this defines our work for the rest of the year. However, I do think it's important for us to come back and continue the conversation after we work with our public and work with, um, work with other teachers and continue to push on that. But again, like we're also thinking about like, when we are back in a full instructional mode, we want to be ready to go. Helen? Yeah, Helen. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I was thinking about what you were saying about the national study and how it said kids are at, at whatever, uh, haven't fallen back as far as they might. As far as they expected, yes. Yeah. But I, I think, and I'm wondering, I guess is my question, have we looked at our students now that we've had almost a half a year of, uh, of teaching and where we're at? Are, you know, have we done that uh, evaluation or are we going to? Yeah, I um, know that. Oh, go ahead, Casey. Oh, yeah, after um, and see, no, go ahead. Go ahead. So I talked a, a little bit with Joanna Lieberman, and I know that her team is trying to gather data um, in the younger grades uh, for students who are learning to read and looking at the early literacy skills. And um, what they are finding is that we are beginning to see a, um, uh, a higher number of students compared to previous years who are not um, attaining those literacy skills at the rate that we have seen. And so then that begs the question of like, okay, now what? Because now we have a larger group of kids who need um, or could really benefit from literacy intervention before the end of the school year. That's the data I have uh, yeah, from and, that end. And I know you can't see, but Joanna's actually here. So Joanna, do you have anything? Oh. Anything that? Yep, <laughs> that's Sorry. what I was gonna toss it to. What did you want me to address specifically, Michelle? Oh, I was, they were asked, we were talking about um, the assessment and anything else that you wanted to add to what Casey shared um, in terms of, of, you know, what we're learning. Uh, but I do, what I do want to also add, Helen, to what you were saying is that one of the things that we've discovered, and I think Susan brought this up, like having the benchmark assessments, we don't necessarily have really good ways to look at students across a grade and see like, how are they doing? Are they all getting to, are they all moving towards those, those skills that we want them to? And I think that that's a really good discussion for us to maybe have with the next piece of this with you is, so what could that look like? Um, because we do need that information, especially, and the, again, it comes back to what the pandemic highlighted for us. It highlighted that we don't have the necessarily, we have the BAS and the reading information that Joanna's team collects, but we don't have information in any other area. So how do we start to look at that? And I think it's an excellent question. I really appreciate you bringing it up. But Joanna, was there anything you wanted to add to the um, not really. I, I mean, I think what Casey was referring to was just knowing that we had a gap of um, in instruction for some students, particularly in the spring, students who were um, who didn't connect online as regularly, um, perhaps um, who may have come to a summer literacy program but didn't because of the remote nature of it it's our initial exploration of where students are um, showed that, you know, we definitely have need of um, sort of an, an extra boost to help us particularly be able to tease out how much of it is a question of um, 
just needing some regular consistent instruction for, you know, three or four months running, um, and then who has some significant deficit. So who needs a boost and who needs a, a much sort of deeper, broader look? One of the challenges that we're facing is um, a reduced core of interventionists this year. So trying to figure out how we get everybody who needs that extra support access to that support this year. Um, and that's a but challenge. We have, we have class sizes that are really small that you should be able to do the intervention within the class, no? Um, typically that additional sort of tier two plus support is provided by interventionists and a number of those folks, either the positions went unfilled as in service of- Yeah, no, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that, but okay. So that's pretty much where the sort of K to A group has to share, unless there's anything else. Um, I do want to let you know that all of the people on this call, all the coordinators were like totally part of this conversation and engaged in helping us bring this to you. And we thank you for that. Uh, Susan, did I saw Susan and Carlin, did you want to say something? Yeah, no, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, we, we don't get much chance to thank the coordinators and department heads, and this has just been an incredible year. Um, so thank you, thank you. We're, I'm so happy we're entering 2021, um, but, but thank you for the incredible work last spring, over the summer, and this fall. It's just been, um, it, it would take too long to, to thank you, but just thank you. Um, I guess the, the only last question I have is, as we think about sort of moving into the second part of this year, the number one question that I get from parents, especially RLA and sort of hybrid parents is, so at the end of this year, what was my kid supposed to have learned? Um, and I know it's sort of this deceptively simple question. Um, and so I'm not sure how to answer it. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think I think we need an answer. I don't, I don't know how to answer it. So sort of look to you all for, for guidance on that of just how do we express to people and, and Gabe, I'm totally with you. I'm, I'm not in the memorize, you know, the presence and order camp. I, so hopefully I didn't give any of those examples. I think the examples are just sort of those, the fundamentals. Um, I, I totally agree with, with that. And so how, how do we, how do we respond to that so that there's, so we do, because again, especially if you take an equity lens um, across and you start to prioritize needs um, and, and we know that, you know, anyway, so that would be helpful. And I propose that being part of the next discussion because I think that's a much bigger topic and I know like there's a whole high school agenda and we could be here all night with that. Um, but I think part of that relates to the policy question about what do we actually expect people to teach and what's okay not to teach. And I'll just put in the chat the link to the current learning expectations, which again kind of led us to this conversation, the ones that we've narrowed for the year. I'll just put it into the chat for people to share. It's, it's on the district website but it doesn't get clearly at the depth of what we're proposing we do. And just my comment, Jen, was um, sort of to Helen's point earlier around the portrait of the graduate work and the buy-in from the community. Um, just being part of this process, working with the other coordinators and talking about and revisiting that, you know, being a teacher that went, was on the other side going through that process, it needs to go back to everyone because the, um, so many of the teachers are just in survival mode, right? But it was really invigorating to have this experience again with my coordinating colleagues because it's like, oh yeah, that's what we're about. Like those are the skills that we're trying to teach. And so that was refreshing. <laughs> and it was really, I, I, I want my colleagues and, my, and the teachers to experience that again. So I, I, I just wanted to make that point. Well, I think this is a, a good beginning to our conversation. Um, are there additional things that we want to cover in the K-8 model or K-8 curriculum um, before we go to the high school that we should talk about today before we move on? And then the other half part of that question is what are things that we might want to revisit in January or February when, whenever it would be appropriate just to sort of keep things, the conversation going, sort of what's the next step or the next level of the conversation? Uh, the other, uh, go for it. Yep. Yeah, the other part for me is, is well, all the curriculum parts are important, but math and, and English tend to be the ones that 
we sort of concentrate on, and I haven't heard anything about math, and that's sort of sequential. And if you don't learn it along the way, it's it's hard to get get those pieces. So I'm wondering what we're doing with that, mm-hmm. and how we're evaluating you know, where kids are at. The same way as with uh, yeah, I hear you, Helen. Actually. Arts really glad that we started off the conversation with like the social studies science lens because we've had heard a lot about from the community in fact about how you know we talk about Suzanne brought up about minutes and how much time we're spending and so sort of mm-hmm. the balance although um, they're really you know core skills and I think it all builds together and so I, I do yeah. I really do think that it's hard for us to really clearly answer the question about what it is that kids need to know by the end of the year until we do a lot of this. I mean, we have answers, but I would, I think that our answers can be even better um, if we do this work of sort of aligning what the expectations are with this, you know, we need to, we need, I think there's a little shuffling with the state for some, not all content areas, but some. And so, and I think putting in this idea of like, what are the things that we want students to be able to do um, you know, not, you know, not just read on grade level, but do what when they're reading on grade level? What is it that we want them to be able to do? What are they reading about? (laughs) Right. So, and that's the thing, right? There's all these great opportunities to read about topics in science and social studies and and to talk about, you know, if you're working on civil rights, right, to incorporate that Mm -hmm. into the reading material. So, and I just think that we'll have such a clearer vision of what this all looks like and what students should be able to do. Students will be able to do what with this material, I think is really important. So I think it's gonna take some time. And I, and I think that, you know, sort of the alignment comes um, and, and then we start looking at what we want students to do and then how we teach that or how individual teachers approach that. Um, I don't know. So. Yes, there's a lot. We we pro- we clearly don't have enough time this year to deal with all the things that we need to deal with um, or want to deal with. So the question becomes, how do we keep going one foot in front of the other, making progress to our goal? Um, and so I guess so I'll re-ask my first question. Are there any things from the K-8 piece that we really should cover? I know people put a lot of time and thought into this and I and I just acknowledge the really long conversations already after five. And so I really thank everyone. This is a, a very stressful time. It's been a very stressful time for a very long time, which is stressful in itself. Um, and people are working really hard. And I really thank all of you for, for we all thank you for coming um, after work hours um, to do this work with us, to help us through this process. Suzanne, did you wanna? Yeah, just for I just for a conversation down the road, I, I, Joanna brought it up. It's just this notion of what does a tier one, tier two, or tier three intervention look like during the pandemic, and this this thought that that Helen mentioned that the classes are actually quite small when they are in the building right now, and so we might want to rethink about who are the interventionists and what does that look like. And so it's not for tonight's conversation, but I would I would love to visit that. Uh, down the road so that we really can take advantage of, of the time that we have from January through June or until people are back. So yeah, and to piggyback onto that, Suzanne, one of the questions that I have, and I think it's partially a budgetary constraint, um, is how we do pull out services during tier one instruction. And especially uh, during the pandemic, because it, it looks a little different right now. And so it does. And I think that that's a, a budget piece, but that requires more information from the district to us about how we can address that. But making sure that students who are getting pull out services, whether it's special ed or ELL or, or any, you know, OT, any service that they're not missing the tier one instruction, exactly. which then creates a need for a tier two instruction. So exactly. Um, I just think it's so important that we get to that. And that's, this is what I mean. I feel like there's so many pieces that it's easy to get sort of lost in a, in one piece. And we're trying to keep all of the, the, keep all the boats afloat. Um, so sorry, I don't know if I got an answer. Is there any other K-8 pieces that we should cover tonight? I want to respect people's time and, and their effort that they put in. Michelle, is there anything we need to cover? Okay. Okay. So I think that the next piece is um, maybe Michelle, after this meeting and we digest everything, um, I'll ask the school committee members, the subcommittee members at the end, sort of what they think the next steps are. And then we'll con- you know, obviously get some feedback from you about next steps for January and or February. 
Um, and so if anyone has any additional questions, I would like to let the K-8, if there are specific K-8 staff here that don't need to be here for the high school, I'm not sure if there is, I know there's a lot of K-12 coordinators um, to go and enjoy whatever is left <laughs> of their evening with their families um, and thank them for their time and their service. And so, and I also want to respect the high school staff that are here. So thank you to everyone. If, if you, you're always welcome to stay, but if you'd like to go, you're welcome to go. That's pretty much the standard staying, saying at these meetings lately. Um, thank you to all of our high school staff and our, our K-12 staff that are here to talk with us. Um, Michelle, do you want to send us off in a direction for this part of the conversation? Or is this going, who's, who's leading hey, our high school? Is this I'm going to send it to Anthony. All right, thank you, Mr. Meyer. Thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure to have all of you with us. Sure. Take it away. Well, I guess thanks, Jennifer, and thanks, um, Curriculum Subcommittee, for having us. Um, I think the idea is that we're touching base, at least from my conversation with Michelle, about essential curriculum, um, which, as you know, and we're just talking about, I imagine, for more than an hour, was an initiative that started um, under Nicole Gittens. And so I think um, I asked uh, some of our coordinators to join us if they wanted to. And so I see um, Josh Paris of math, Ed Weiser of science, and John Andrews of English. And I think we just want to share whatever information would be helpful. I would say, and Michelle and I have talked pretty candidly about this, um, we have not put the same emphasis in the same way, I believe, on essential curriculum as uh, our K-8 to partners did. I think we've worked um, on teaming and common experiences across subject areas, and certainly um, the pandemic and last spring pushed us in that direction in a number of ways, the variance that um, kids experienced, uh, as well as the sheer need for teaming and sharing curriculum. Um, so we've moved in the direction, I would say, of I mean, we've always had um, strong curricular teams and under uh, Ed, Josh, and you know John has been in the role. This is just his second year, but there certainly is a great deal there are a great deal, there is a great deal of teaming across the various courses um, that, the, uh, that these gentlemen could speak to. What would, be, what would be most important for your time as the curriculum subcommittee? What would be important for you all to hear or to walk out of here with from the high school leadership? So I think I think probably different members have some different pieces that they that they might be curious about. And I think in general, we're thinking about what our curriculum looks like and how and one of the things that we talked about in the in the previous hour session was this. Well, I guess I brought it up, but I know um, Michelle, I think, also mentioned it, and maybe Gabe, this idea of like horizontal and vertical alignment. And so, you know, uh, teams of teachers, departments working together and coordinating, but also the, you know, sort of the grade above and the grade below, understanding what skills, you know, for example, ninth grade, this is sort of one of the conversations we've had a number of times over in curriculum, but also at full school committee over the years has been, how do we make sure that kids coming from the different K-8 schools are ready to enter the ninth grade model at the high school? How do we make sure? And I think that's a part of this idea of making sure that some students have some shared core experiences to enable them to be successful, no matter which K-8 school they come from um, in the high school. And so that's important for the comp to facilitate. And I think we've done this in some, maybe all content areas, I'm not sure at the high school, and that might be helpful for people to know between sort of eighth grade teachers, ninth grade teachers and 10th grade teachers having that vertical alignment where you know what skills ninth grade is expecting and what skills eighth grade is teaching. And I, and I do think there may be some reworking to make sure that all of those things are in alignment with the state frameworks that shift from time to time. And it's been a while since I think we've done some of that analysis. Um, you know, and it, so anyways, that's sort of one of the things that I'm thinking about and wondering about, but would other members of the curriculum subcommittee ch like to chime in about high school specific things that they're interested in? Seeing none, oh, Ms. Scotto? 
Um, the question I have is a question that I have gotten from a couple of parents, and it refers to the high school and the high school curriculum. Given the fact that we are in the pandemic, I think that there are parents who are wondering what is and isn't being covered this year. And I think the concern probably comes, comes about because people, when their children get in the high school, people begin to see the end in sight, so to speak. And the need for applying to college and the need for taking the exams that have to be taken to get into college. And I think people are afraid of what might not be covered because of the situation we're in. And I don't know that it's possible to answer that question really, because that probably varies from class to class and certainly from subject to subject. But do you have any sense of how, how much of the curriculum is being covered? How, many, how much of the skills are being developed that would happen in a regular year, that are, is happening now as compared to, to a regular year? I, I know it's a difficult question, but it is something that a couple of people have asked me. Should we first hear all of the questions and then we can dive into them or what would be best, Jennifer? Because I'm hearing two sort of general questions thus far. Um, you're talking vertical and horizontal alignment, but in particular a focus and it's evergreen at the high school and evergreen in the public schools of Brookline, that eighth to ninth grade uh, transition. And then Barbara, you may have just heard from a couple or a few parents, but I, I think we would all agree many parents of the high school worry about sheer content. What can you cover in a more, you know, we have less instructional time with kids. So, I mean, I, I, on both questions, I would say Ed, Josh, and John know much more specifically what content, I would say math and science, and this is an English teacher speaking, are much more content heavy, whereas English and social studies you know, has, they have their share of content, but they tend to English, especially to use spiraling of skills, um, you know, practice with reading and writing. Um, but so would it be helpful to begin answering or should we wait for a couple more questions and then go from there and hear from um, the more expert administrators? So um, Helen or Susan, if you have any other burning questions that you want to address at this time, or should we, I'm thinking let's, Let's deal with the two that we have. They're pretty big, meaty questions. And I do wanna just sort of like add on, sort of highlight one of the pieces of mine, which was we spent some time in the previous hour talking about um, the alignment or like analyzing where our learning expectations are versus sort of where the state frameworks are. And it's been a while, like for example, in social studies, some new frameworks came out in 2018, but it's the learning expectations haven't been updated since 1415. And so there's, they're not necessarily aligned. And so that's some work that needs to be done sort of at, you know, a, a curriculum coordinator or, or department level. So I think, I mean, to begin with. And so I don't know if there's any work begun on that or conversations and maybe it applies less to the high school um, benchmarks um, and expectations than it does to a K-8 situation. I, I'm less familiar with high school. so. That would just be helpful as part of the conversation about the alignment, I think, for me. Um, so do we, we can start with either question, whatever people wanna jump into would be, I think would be helpful for all of us. That sounds good. And I, I should have celebrated first that the BEU ratified um, the MOA. So just to take a moment and um, breathe a sigh of relief and feel gratitude towards our BEU partners and also to the school committee and Suzanne for her leadership that was a serious time commitment. And I think we emerged um, from that with a really strong agreement. I know that you all are voting on it. The school committee is voting on it on Thursday, but um, I'm really excited about the agreement um, and think mostly it was worth the time. Now it was a lot of time, but, um, but I think it's the right agreement. So um, that's huge. The other just, um, Side note, because I'm not sure, maybe Susan knows this as a, a high school parent, 
we made a decision not to have our same mid-year examination structure. So as long as I've been at Brookline High School, there has been a mid-year classes end in late January and we devote time to examinations in the major content areas. And for a number of reasons, chiefly loss of instructional time uh, and sort of stress and anxiety, as well as some challenges of assessing student learning, um, remote, you know, with remote learners in particular, we made a decision not to engage in mid-year examinations. And it may be that we've opened a door and, and we um, move away from that structure over time. That's something that we will reassess, but it's a pretty, I'd say a, a pretty major decision uh, to go in a different direction. Um, and I know that some of the coordinators think that that's a direction we should be going, um, even if I love the practice of mid-year exams and, and giving students, I also like the lull in the year in some ways and watching students work super hard. Um, but so I, I, um, those are just two pieces. I don't know, Ed, Josh, John, what do you think about um, talking about content, how much content, um, what we're covering, what we're not covering, um, some general. Ed, it looks like you're ready to go, unmuted. Yeah, oh, yeah sorry, I am, I'm, I'm ready to go. Because I, sorry, I, I love your question, could, Jennifer. Could I, I just wanted to, um, we did this at the beginning and I've realized that um, it would be great if our staff at the high school could introduce themselves because we are being recorded. And so there, um, there are members of the community who may not be familiar with you. And if you could, if we could just quickly, I should have done this and I apologize earlier, but if, if people could just quickly introduce themselves and I'm so sorry to cut you off, I, I apologize. No, no worries, no worries. I'm Ed Weiser, head of the science department at the high school. Um, and I, I teach physics um, with my team of physics teachers. Um, and, and so Jennifer, the, 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 the new standards with science has, it's been a long story. Uh, I'll try to get to it quickly. Last year was supposed to be the first year that they were gonna have an online version of the MCAS exam for physics and biology, not chemistry. Um, and so we were trying to get prepared for that as best as we could as COVID started to happen. And there was gonna be a brand new unit on um, the nuclear energy, fission and fusion. So we spent a lot of our time in the spring doing that. Since then, the, um, the Department of Education has pivoted, gone back to the paper test. They say that they're gonna give. So we had to go back and do the old standards. So we were getting ready to do the new ones. Now we're gonna do the, so it's, it's, it's back and forth, but I feel like we're going to be fairly well prepared for that. But when it comes down to the standards, um, to the other ones, so chemistry, the next generation science standards have informed the new standards that Massachusetts is using. We go above and beyond those. We don't really try to figure out exactly where we fit in with that one, even more so with biology. So, um, so our curriculum in those two courses, and, and based, based on the virtue of our sequence, physics, chemistry, and biology, our vertical alignment is, uh, I mean, it, it's perfectly well, well, well planned out. It's a, it's a ladder that we always know which way to climb. Um, and we are having those conversations about what are we doing now? Oh, and that was the other reason why we did the nuclear stuff is because we got students familiar with atomic structure so that they would be ready for chemistry. Um, and we thought that that was a pretty good plan. Same thing with chemistry last year, getting kids ready for biology. So that's kind of that vertical alignment. But we always do struggle with that transition from eighth to ninth. And one of the things that we've been doing with the help of the Innovation Fund is um, trying to make sure that all kids have a good sequence, like they're all starting at the same spot in September on just energy, a little project with energy, and then we're moving through the curriculum. And I, I, I'm, I would love to show you what that looks like too, but I don't wanna take up too much time because these Zoom meetings tend to force the speaker to talk too much. But Josh, if you wanted to go next. Sure, Ed, I'll go next. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Josh Paris. I'm the um, math department coordinator at the high school. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot to say on this. Um, I think the road to the math MCAS at the high school is similar to what Ed described in science. You know, when the 2011 frameworks came out, there was supposed to be a new MCAS 2.0, and then that kept on getting delayed um, and finally got implemented in the 10th grade um, last year, maybe a little bit the year before. And so, 
it's really been a long road coming um, to another point Ed has made. But in general, we, we go beyond what the state frameworks say in Brookline, which has put us really in good place this year because you know, we are teaching less content. We have less time and there's a lot going on with the kids. And, um, but we can, we can cut some content and still meet all of the state frameworks. Um, and so um, that's what we've been working on. Um, Let's see what else. The transition from eighth to ninth grade. Yeah, I think we're in good a good place with that in math. Like, you know, I worked very closely with Kathleen Hubbard and, you know, continue to work with um, Matt on, um, you know, on making sure that the transition from eighth to ninth grade is where we want it. We, we've met over various summers with eighth and ninth grade teachers. We met last, we met this summer again with some eighth and ninth grade teachers and we just had another meeting in November. So um, we have, you know, and I've been a pretty big part of listening in on what's going on with the um, K through eight math, you know, math review, program review and with the new, um, you know, math program at the middle school level. And, um, we're very excited about it because, you know, the hope is that with this new um, math curriculum in the middle school that there will be more of a standardization across all eight schools. Um, that's always been a little challenge for us at the high school because it seemed like kids would be doing some different things and in all the eight elementary schools and then they come to the high school and we're like, some kids have seen some things and others haven't. That's always going to be the case, I think, in Brookline because of what Brookline is. But I think it's less so now. And I'm hopeful that even that, you know, like I said, with the, the new math that they're putting in in the middle school, that that'll be less so, which makes our job here in the, in the high school. Um, what we're seeing is, you know, so there's been a shift, you know, since we, you know, since we, since we revised curriculum after the 2011 um, frameworks came out. And I know math came out again with, I think in 2017 with new frameworks, but um, they weren't really all that different than the 2011 frameworks in math. And again, because we go beyond those anyways, it really didn't impact what we do at the high school very much. Um, but the middle school, you know, has moved away from, you know, purely doing algebra in eighth grade and to some extent, seventh grade. And doing more of a um, sort of integrated curriculum, more, more geometry and statistics. Um, so our ninth grade then, um, we have a course that's called geometry, but really we do less geometry than we did in the past because they do a lot more of it in the middle school. And we've ramped up, you know, doing a lot more algebra in the ninth grade because in 10th grade, all students take algebra too. And we need to make sure we're ready for that. So this year with COVID, that's what we're focusing on. Like we are making sure in ninth grade, I teach geometry honors in ninth grade. We are making sure that, you know, the units that, we're, that we've chosen to do um, are the ones that are more heavily based in algebra. Um, and so that, um, yeah, because we want the kids ready for, for next year. So I think, I think we'll be in, a, a good position for that. We've ramped up what we do in algebra a lot. Um, we knew we were gonna have to do that anyways, even before COVID came and now are doing it even more so. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that they'll be ready for, for 10th grade. Um, the work that we have to do, speaking of vertical alignment is gonna be challenging. I, I won't deny it, it's gonna be challenging because of what Helen mentioned before you know, math is a continuum. And so, you know, you have to study one thing before you can study something else. Um, so I talked about ninth grade to 10th grade, which I think we're in a good place. I'm concerned about 10th to 11th and 11th to 12th. Um, that's where like we hit heavy out, you know, even heavier algebra stuff. And, you know, we're not teaching as much. So we're gonna have to figure, honestly, we're gonna have to figure that out. It's been on my mind you know, since last March, really. Um, and um, as sort of we see, as we get a, cl a more a clearer picture of the specific content that we're teaching this year, um, from now through the spring, I mean, we're gonna be getting into this work heavily um, 
figuring out how we need to adjust our 10th, 11th, and or more really 11th and 12th grade courses moving moving forward. Um, so we'll be, you know, we have a very close knit department. Our cur curriculum teams are very strong. Like Anthony mentioned, we do so much work in curriculum teams. Um, and the work that we need to do in the spring is going to be putting curriculum teams across, like we talk about horizontally, across levels together to figure out how we need to make adjustments to our curriculum. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always, you know, I'm, I fully believe in our, that we are capable of doing that and we'll do that. And it's going to be hard work. Um, so anyways, I think that's what I have, have for now. Josh or Jennifer, if I could just insert one thing, um, just reflecting on both Ed and, and Josh's comments. First of all, my name is Anthony Meyer and I'm the head of school at Brookline High School. Um, uh, in the case of Josh, and I think this is true of Ed and he touched on experiential physics. One of the things I've heard Josh say repeatedly um, to parents um, on our curriculum night for incoming, you know, for eighth grade families is that ninth graders at Brookline High School study all of the same topics in geometry. The question is at what depth and how much time? Um, and I think that has been an important shift uh, under Josh and due to his leadership is that sort of those common experiences. Um, in the same way, Ed touched on experiential physics. That has been, I, I would say, Ed knows better, I would say a major change in the culture of the department, which has always been collaborative, but the documentation of, um, you know, of lesson plans, the uh, dissemination so that all teachers are teaching fairly similar lessons, the feedback loop, and then the improvement of those lesson plans. And again, the documentation, that's not something we're necessarily always strong at. And um, I, you know, across the whole school, there's a lot of autonomy. I would say in math and science in particular, there has been a tremendous amount of work to have more common experiences. But Josh and Ed, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything that doesn't seem true to you given this year and the particular challenges. No, it's, it's totally right on the money. Um, I was actually kind of prepared to show you what that looked like because I think we, you know, we can talk all the time, but, um, but I don't know if I can share that uh, if the host doesn't let me know, I can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Oh, Rob. Oh, of course, Robin solved it. Um, so this right here, just to give you an idea, over on to the, the left, master planning, all sorts of things are going into this. Unit 10 will be nuclear. We're going to shorten that up because that's not on the MCAS this year. Who knows what's going to happen? But this is unit three right now. These are, so you know, um, just kind of the brainstorming sections right here. This is, this looks like it's a professional document, but this is all ours. Um, guiding questions, unit experiences, um, modeling with computer uh, simulations. This is also a shout out to the Innovation Fund's um, computer science grant that Josh and I, we, we have um, a few teachers involved with. And then it gets to connect theory of gases, um, heat and um, thermal energy. And also um, we're introducing pendulums in the, the next unit. Um, but that's not all. Um, it goes down to like exactly what the days should be like. Um, here are some slide decks and things. This is just the first bit of um, the, the demo was just uh, putting food coloring into hot and cold water and asking kids to predict what that behavior would be like and a few other documents. This is the computer simulation one. You'll love, hopefully you'll love this. All kids were given this simulation where they could go in, oh, I'm getting the, the color spinner, where they can go and see what the code is and they can change it. And if you run it, this little red dot is wiggling and it starts to infect the other ones and it turns red. So, one, so students were then given the opportunity to expand that and go further. And this is, this is the top one that we got. So a student just did all of this on their own this is the final version of it where um, I could uh, reset it and go. And they, they, they have a number of survivors and the number of people who have passed away from it. 
and some people who have been infected and never recovered. And students have done this all by going into this little code center and just messing around with it. It's pretty amazing. And so that also goes to um, the fact that we're going from random motion to, part of, to um, patterned motion in terms of waves, sound, and then the pendulums and moving on. So that's how, uh, so that's, uh, and the only way this is possible is through the Innovation Fund. I have to say that. Last year, there were several releases. This year, there are um, the total of 0.4 um, FTE releases. And that's the type of work that uh, is going on in the physics. So I don't know, I, sh I should open it up to see if there are any questions about that. Do we have any questions? I don't have questions. I'm just excited. You just made me excited about learning. I was like, this is awesome. This is so exciting. And it's so nice to hear um, the passion from our from our educators and from um, our curriculum coordinators about what they what they're teaching and learning is. It's so exciting. Yeah. Do other people have questions? Because keeping in mind that all of the teachers are doing, so yes, they might be a little bit out of sync depending on the day and they, what they wanted to focus on here or there. But that is, in a nutshell, I mean, I mean, I, I could be completely wrong, but in terms of essential curriculum and trying to figure out how collaboration really drives forward um, you know, the learning for all students, I think that this is a great example. And it, it's hats off to the Innovation Fund and the, and the teachers are just amazing. Well, it's, it's a beautiful document. I, I love, it looks, it's very clean. It's very organized, um, easy to read and follow, which is um, right. a really nice way to, for people to have a common basis for discussion about how, you know, the pedagogy of a lesson and how to approach it. It's, it's really nice looking. Um, because the way to do it is through Canvas where teachers have a shared course and they can make an assignment and then export that to everybody. And that's, that's a great way to do that so that all of the, the there's a familiar nomenclature to the assignments so that um, support staff and learning centers and tutorial know exactly what's happening. Oh, it's 3B, blah, blah, blah. So I know what's happening there. So it's been effective in that regard as well. Um, chemistry and biology are doing similar things, but they don't have that release time. And so they're using uh, Google documents and other ways to kind of align themselves and to be able to share and uh, collaborate and you know, delegate to be a, as effective as possible too. Um, but Barbara, I, I don't know if we've gotten you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Helen, hi. Helen? Hi, how are you, Ed? Um, so I was wondering, the experience that the teachers are having with where students are because of the three or four months of, of last year and the beginning of the year being somewhat truncated, how are you guys dealing with it? And maybe I should ask John because he's been left out of all of this so far. <laughs> Um, but I'm asking all of you, I mean, are we going to need more intense summer school this summer to catch kids up? Are we going, are we thinking about that? Um, do we need to think about as a school committee to, to finance it for those kids who are really far behind? So I'm John Andrews and I'm the curriculum coordinator for uh, grades nine through 12 for the English department. Um, and I, I'll just weigh into Helen's question a little bit. I think what we're seeing we're sort of really one month into being in this hybrid model, right? We're still, we're just coming out of the first month really of, of the 10 through 12 students being at the high school. And I think we're settling down now. I think we're settling into an understanding that this is our normal and things are calming. We don't feel like we're in a crisis all the time. Um, and that's really That's good. That is good. That's huge. That's great. That's huge. <laughs> that's huge. And it also means that we can now think about learning differently. We're not thinking about HEPA filters and, and spacing. We can get to the, the real questions now about schooling. And what's coming up is the, the, the growing gap between some kids who are fine and who are able to work in this in, in, in this situation, but there are still, there's a community of kids, there's a number of kids who are really struggling, who we could identify in the spring and we saw them struggling in the spring and they're continuing to, uh, to struggle. Um, some of them have chosen to be fully remote and they're not coming in. And there are lots of reasons why they've chosen to be fully remote, which we support and, and understand. And yet they're falling further behind. So um, I heard you talking about interventions. It's, it's a challenge to think about interventions uh, when kids are struggling so much with just engaging on a, on a really fundamental level. And so we'll see a much bigger majority of kids than we saw in the spring who are 
closer to what we would consider normal for this year, who are able to do the academic expectations that we have. Um, and some of us are feeling like, oh, we should be revving up now. Now's the, okay, we've got this normal. Now it's time to speed up and get closer to what we could do before. And at the same time, there's a percentage of kids um, who, are, who are still way behind. And so how do we reach back to them, help them catch up, love them enough to get them back <laughs> into where they need to be, right? While also acknowledging that there are some kids who are, who are chomping at the bit a little bit and are ready to do a little bit more. So, um, so summer school, yeah, probably. Um, but I don't know if giving them the option of summer school is gonna be enough. <laughs> I just don't know if the struggle is getting into the building, if the struggle is getting out of um, a crisis mode, which some families or some students may still be in, how do you then help them see that education is the thing that, that they need to grab onto that might help them get out of that crisis? Um, it's a real challenge, I think. Um, but as I've watched my staff leave sort of panic mode and settle into normal, I've recognized that getting people to accept that this is where we are and now we can work is a huge step and not all kids are there yet. Thank you. And Helen, I would just answer your summer school question. I think John gets at how complicated the question is of how to support kids who've continued to struggle from March, probably before March, through the pandemic into the beginning of this year. I just want to acknowledge we ran a very limited summer school program, given that we were still really in the midst of a school closure. And there have also been questions about the funding source um, of our summer school program. And it's never been um, self-funded. Um, so my understanding um, from Mary Ellen Norman in the early work on budgeting is that one of the reserves she's looking to establish would be to support, among other things, a summer school program. So I, I don't think that that can be the only approach. We're looking at um, improvements to our program, and that those include um, looking at what kind of remote interventions or remote supports we can offer or supports to remote students. We certainly have um, many supports and teachers available to what pretty much is very few students coming into the building, 10 to 12, ninth grade more, but it's a pretty small number mm -hmm. of students given the number of COVID cases and frankly given the very flexible system we've set up for learning and teaching. Um, and I think it's the right system, but it can, many students feel like, you know what, I can be getting the, a similar experience or a more efficient experience by being at home when in fact, many of them would be, I think better served having that personal interaction and attention from teachers. So, um, I wonder, John, in terms of the eighth to ninth grade, I know that Mary Birchnall, before you, and now you have really worked on the ninth grade course, um, and, and you're also thinking about our overall scope and sequence. So I wonder if you can speak to um, English. Sure, sorry. Um, I would just say that the culture that math and science describe of collaboration and peers working together is, infected the whole ninth grade program. So um, we have a sort of an A team, I would say our varsity teachers teaching ninth grade English. And there is not a more collaborative group uh, in our department than that group. Um, they share curriculum, they share content, they share pedagogy, they plan regularly every week. Um, they've been pretty much in step. Well, I joined them this year because I wanted to see how it works. So I'm teaching ninth grade as well. But um, we've been pretty much in step for the first 12 weeks of the, the year and are beginning to head in slightly different directions. But the ninth grade for the last five or six years has had a common midterm exam that teachers grade from other teachers. So I would pass my papers to another teacher. And so it's built just a very in, uh, intentional sense of collegiality and focus and purpose. Uh, behind the ninth grade curriculum, which I think is essential when kids are coming from eight different directions and we want to then filter them into the rest of the school. So they're all having a very clear core experience, uh, I think in ninth grade that's been valuable. 
Um, Mary did good work before she retired, um, getting us to think about uh, curriculum frameworks and how our, our classes aligned with what the state was asking us to do. Um, my goal is to do that again uh, in the next year or two. I'd like to start it this spring. I think um, I wanted to start the conversation this summer, but people were too panicked to do it. So now that I think we're, we're we're getting back to, okay, now what's happening? How do we do this? It's time to look again and say, okay, this is what we said two or three years ago. Now we need to look at what the kids are doing this year and how does it align with what we, we what our goals are. Anthony mentioned earlier, and it's true that English is a spiraling curriculum where kids are working on similar close reading, um, writing narrative, writing literary analysis, all the way through 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, but digging in deeper um, as we go further and further uh, up the years uh, towards graduation. So many of the skills repeat and, and go further uh, in intensity. Um, but we still need to look and make sure that we have that sort of vertical and horizontal alignment. Um, we've started uh, focusing our department meetings around student work. So the last uh, month and a half of meetings have been bring, teachers bringing in content, groups of five or six doing a critical friends protocol, the type of thing that Gene Thompson Grove used to do, um, and, and talking about work specifically, but then thinking about the implications for our own practice. And I think getting back to the student writing and, and really diving into writing um, is the way that we're gonna to articulate the differences in what, we've, what we're doing versus what we'd like to be able to do. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say in terms of what, what's being covered, um, less, I think we're covering less. Uh, we, we set an intentionally careful goal of not requiring kids to do more than six hours of homework a week um, to support social emotional learning uh, and just to think about the, the emotional and mental health of our students this year. But that's meaning we can't read as many books together uh, in a year and we can't um, uh, well, we can't read as many books. We're still writing a lot, I'll say that. Um, but I think we, if we counted the number of books, we're probably reading two fewer books a year than we might have in the past. We might have read 10 to 12 books in a year. Now we're reading more like eight to 10. So it's a change, it's, it's a loss. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say that I wanted to bring up, we are, um, some of our ninth grade teachers went to a conference with some of the middle school teachers last year. Uh, before all this started um, about reading in the in the English classroom, which has been very helpful um, and sort of rethinking the role of class uh, shared reading experiences versus lit circles and having groups of kids read books together and having an anchor text. So I think we're getting a nice cross pollination with our middle school teachers about ways to approach reading um, that's allowing us to diversify the way we think about uh, reading instruction in ninth grade. And I think eventually that will get to 10th, 11th and 12th. Hope that helps. Um, Suzanne, did you want to join in? Thank well, you. Well, I just want to say it just warms my heart to hear about critical friends groups. So thank you for that. <laughs> and looking at student work, my first, my first uh, form into that was in 1998, and then 99. I remember. Be, anyway, I think it's fabulous stuff. I hope we can bring it down to the K to eights. I hope they do some of that. And I also two other things is. Um, Again, I'm, for me, in high, I'm not a high school person, so thinking about the whole child in high school feels like an added uh, lift of some kind. And so thank you for whatever you do, but I'm, I'm not sure how that works in high school. I mean, it's one thing when you're you know, there. So that, if you wanna say something about that or the next time we meet um, is also a possibility. And then quickly, I just wanna say, I, I don't know what you're doing about the whole staff person, but I, I hope that there are some things going on at the high school that addresses the health and well-being of our staff, because I think this is just such a challenging time um, and for all of you and all of your people. And so I do appreciate that, but I hope that we, we have things that are available to help them, because I know it's a hard time. John, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I just was um, tossing that I think we've been trying to think about the whole child in lots of ways. I think our, our wellness classes do that very carefully. But there's also been a mindfulness initiative throughout the school in the last few years that's been important that I know teachers still participate. Our advisory program asks kids to slow down and do meditative experiences twice a week uh, or do stretching. Like there's lots of ways I think we're thinking about it, but I'm thinking about just our three disciplines that each of our discipline has leaned more and more on um, 
community work with students, so thinking about how students work together, how students solve problems together, how they experience science together. And so one of the ways I think we're addressing the whole student is really encouraging them to be members of community in their academic learning. And that's been a challenge in the current situation. I think the hybrid and the remote has made it particularly hard. And yet I've heard our focus on that staying laser sharp, that we're still thinking about how are we continuing the good work we've done before about making sure students understand they're part of a learning community. They're not individual students just trying to get good grades. That warms my heart too. That does. John, that's, I'm going to add to that. Suzanne, it's a really good question. And, and just so everybody on curriculum subcommittee knows, uh, John, Ed, um, and Josh were um, three of the leaders on our innovation fund grant, which really started as a concern about content and content gaps and assessing content gaps in particular for students from eighth to ninth grade. And much of the work this summer, excuse me, focused on that. Um, but our curriculum coordinators, our academic leaders and the teachers with whom they collaborated, 35 to 40, um, pretty much said what we need first is to develop community within our classrooms, within our school, we need to support students around executive functioning and we need to way better support students around the use of Canvas. And so that's really how the school year began and how we used those opening days um, was to develop community um, within our faculty uh, and then very much to share the fruits of the excellent work on that innovation fund grant. And so share work on how, you know, Josh, his, everybody chose a team to be a part of, and Josh was part of that. How do you build um, culture and community within a classroom? And so that's something that we've tried to do. And I would just say it's been a real, that's been terrific. I would say building community and culture within the high school more, more largely right now is really hard. We just don't have many of the traditions and events um, that we usually do. And I find myself writing long emails to students each week now and that's something but it is a drop in the bucket um, compared to what we usually offer in terms of activities um, but it's certainly of interest to us and Suzanne I really appreciate you talking about keeping the educator as human being um, in focus and all of it because I think I certainly can get a little insular in just what do we need to do next? What's our next move in terms of improving? And I think um, it's helpful to have really good curriculum coordinators who both have that focus and also know much more closely what's happening with our teachers and what they need individually and, and collectively. So thanks for the question. Susan? Yeah, so first of all, thank you to all of you again. Um, I said to the last group, we don't get a chance to say thank you to our department heads and curriculum coordinators enough. So last spring, this summer, this fall, we've just been winter, now next spring, um, just everyone has been um, different and hard. And so just thank you for all the passion and dedication um, that you're putting into this. And excuse dinner in the background. Um, over there. Um, my question for you guys is the same one I always ask. So um, Ed, Ed and Anthony hear it a lot. Um, but you know, what, what do you need from us? You know, we are about to enter budget season. Um, obviously, resources are constrained, but I think it's really important for all of us to bring your voices and your priorities into the budget process. Um, and so if there are things that you think we need um, to support teachers, to support students, to support the high school, um, support you guys. Um, it would just be helpful to hear what your priorities are. Um, and it can be an ongoing conversation. I don't wanna put anybody on the spot, but just conceptually speaking, that would be helpful. And then I just wanna hope we continue the conversation throughout the, the winter and the spring, because um, that's just, it's important to me, to all of us, I think, to just to make sure your voices are, are in that process. Um. Uh, thank you for that, Susan. Um, I think at this point, um, and the, the teachers through the MOA have also um, really appreciate time more than the money and resources, because at this point, we don't even know what to get. We've sent a, home a, a, a number of lab kits um, for students to be able to perform labs at home, uh, remotely. Um, obviously, it's not the same experience, but um, that, that doesn't cost as much. We just we need the flexibility to be able to do that. But um, the time is what teachers are really hoping for. So that 
the half day isn't being able to have c consistent Wednesdays. Um, it was hard with a lot of the holidays, um, but just that time is a, a real critical piece. Ed, I'll, I'll quickly build on that. And Susan, thank you for the question. Um, I agree with Ed, time is really important. And that's something we've we've seen a decrease um, due to, to hard budget seasons, but a real decrease in the amount of time, especially in the summer that we used to have for our high school team. So our curriculum coordinators and program coordinators would apply to the Office of Teaching and Learning for workshop hours. And, um, you know, it's, we just had dwindling resources and so not as much time for teachers to work on curriculum um, within subject areas, within sub, you know, course teams. Um, and interestingly, other organizations has, have sort of stepped into that void in some ways. I look at that innovation fund grant as incredibly powerful. Um, and uh, it was really great work, but it's work I think in the past that the district might have supported. Um, and so just thinking about that and knowing that resources are, are so very few, and, and as Michelle knows better than anyone, the Office of Teaching and Learning is, is stripped down in a number of ways. But I think looking at those summer workshops and time for teachers and teams, I think is really important. Yeah, just to add to that, I think all of our funding this, this year this summer is is grant funded currently so you know even thinking about the idea of level funding in terms of that though that money th from this year to this year there isn't something to level so just keeping that in mind in terms of the work that anthony's talking about and the work that the curriculum coordinators talked about before um it i mean not the work the k-8 curriculum coordinators talked about that is going to take a fair amount of, of manpower and time to also en engage teachers and have teachers be part of that and thinking about that funding and, and if, if that becomes a priority, having that available for both the K to pre-K to 12 to be doing that work. Thanks, Michelle. And I, I would just say the, the conversation we're having with Mary Ellen about the high school is our numbers are staying pretty consistent from, from this year to next year. I also believe, and this is just my gut, that students and families who left the high school last year, um, I believe will return. And I'm not saying every family by any means, but I think um, my sense of the word on the proverbial street is that the high school experience is really good this year um, and engaging curriculum top-notch instruction. And so I expect that some of the families that left will return. And I know that that's part of Mary Ellen's calculus and thinking about reserves for um, a potential return of students. But I, I, I expect that we'll go through a similar process where we section based on what students are signing up for um, and then make decisions about what courses we believe can run and what courses we believe um, can't run given numbers um, and believe that Mary Ellen will be, we had a good conversation about some of the work. This is Hal Mason, assistant head of school, um, Mary Ellen and I had that conversation about just thinking through um, her first stab at looking at ratios and looking at budgeting. So, um, but I, I don't want jo John or Josh, if you wanna add more to what you need, that would be great. Yeah, uh, I don't have any. I don't have anything different that was said. Yeah, um, we do a lot of work every summer. We're going to have a lot of work to do next. Like I said, in the spring, to to be um, sort of figuring out what experiences our students had this year and how we need to adapt our courses. So, um, yeah, any financial support we can get for teachers to be doing that in the summer would be uh, would be fantastic. Great, that's really helpful. Thank you. And and um, yes, unfortunately, I think um, the reputation of the high school as being a good experience is out there, Anthony. I think you're right. Um, I think that is the word on the street, not only as a parent, but um, among others um, who did choose to make different decisions with their high schoolers this year. And um, 
So I would say it's um it's a good problem to have, but but yes, it uh, it, it may be something that we face um, next year. And we've got a brand spanking new science center that Ed Weiser is building brick by brick. Um, no, but the building is that looks incredible if you haven't seen it, and the um, the twenty two Tappan building a little bit behind, but um, but both buildings just amazing. So huge thanks to the school committee and Susan in particular for her leadership of that mammoth project. So bring them back. We've got space for them. And on that note, my friends, that really high note of the, our beautiful future, um, unless others have additional comments, I think I'd just like to take a minute to um, see if anyone has sort of any um, outlying things that we didn't get to address that we'd like to see addressed in a future meeting um, or things that you think are burning and pressing for a January meeting. Um, we had an idea, um, a possibility of inviting some panel members from some of our other panels to come and join us at a future meeting to also talk about some of that. Um, I do think we need to continue to have a conversation about where curriculum is, is heading um, and the, just the work and the process and where we are and how we can be helpful in that. And, you know, and I think just looking at Suzanne, she's, remind, you know, thinking about if we are able, which I hope, and I don't know, able to go back to a standard model next year, you know, what, um, you know, what conversations can we have about um, allocations of minutes and what work can be done um, on sort of the alignment of the curriculum um, that we were talking about previously. Does any, do any, go ahead, Helen. Just a thought that at some point, and it's not for now, but I think there's some lessons learned from all of this awfulness <laughs> that might serve well for the future. Uh, and it would be nice if, if probably it's the summer uh, type of thing, but to understand are there things that we should be continuing that are working, you know, that, that you know, gee, <laughs> life can be a little bit, uh, school can be a little different than what we've had in the past. Um, so just, I, I don't know if it's a brainstorming session or some sort of, you know, I'd be interested, maybe even to, with the curriculum committee's thoughts that you, you all have. I, I'm not sure what form or how, but the thought is there. You know, that's a really great I, idea, Helen. Um, I'm thinking that that would be helpful information for you know, departments and curriculum coordinators to sort of bubble up to us after they've had some time to sort of like think about that, because I think it's going to take some time and, you know, like having conversations and then sleeping on it and thinking about it more and then coming back and saying like, you know, that made me think about this and that because there might be, um, you know, things that we need to consider as part of the budget for next year about things that worked really well, but there might be lots of other things that are just maybe teacher moves or like decisions that were made that we just keep rolling with. Um, and those don't necessarily cost money aside from this, I you know, this discussion about needing time for educators to work on that and have these conversations and do this work, whether that's in the spring and or the summer. Um, you know, I think that's something that would be interesting to come back to, I don't know, maybe, you know, February, March, some sometime in there before because I think it's important for the people who are doing the work to think about the implications of that and what that might look like for a department in high school budgets or K-8 budgets so that that can be incorporated in. And if we have that conversation too late or of people who need to make those, have those conversations do it too late, then it doesn't get into the budget process. So I think that the earlier that we can encourage people that just sort of reflect on what that might look like on a preliminary level, um, before the numbers get crunched and we think about what do we want, what can we fit in? I think that would be helpful um, to like continue as we mean to go on. Uh, Helen, I'm sorry, Susan, uh, final thoughts? Uh, just final thought, we, we didn't speak very much about racial equity tonight, but one of the things I miss most this year is having students come to school committee and give us their perspectives. Um, so the MSAN group came every single year, told us you know their thoughts, their experience, We've had Metco students come, we've had all kinds of different groups, but particularly with a racial equity lens, I think given the disproportionate impacts of this on, you know, health, on safety, on, you know, academics, on home life, there are just so many different aspects that I think it'd be helpful for us to be able to hear more directly from students um, and also just be more thoughtful about that sort of across the board. I feel like we have it sort of in 
um, specific conversations and it should be baked in across the board. Um, but I wonder if we can kind of pull all of it together and, and think through um, what that means in terms of our budget priorities also because yeah. budgets are values documents um, and, and I just, I miss that voice uh, in the mix. Uh, Barbara? One of the um, things that I think is important that is a long-term thing is the conversation about the effect of this pandemic and the results of it will have had on the schools in the long run. And that's, I think, something that's ongoing, talking about it now, what, what changes are we seeing, et cetera, is, is one thing. But I think that's a conversation also for cer certainly the beginning of next year. What are you thinking about now that will affect your work in the classroom because of what happened in the pandemic? And I think more important than that, it is a question to think about halfway through or at the end of the following of the of next year. What actually did change? What did you think was going to change? What did change? What ideas do you have moving into the future? Because this whole notion um, of something like a pandemic coming in, you know, it's it it. It may happen more in the future, but I think the notion of change and how you use what's going on around you to craft what you're doing and how you test that out and how you look both backward and forward. What aren't we doing that we were doing two years ago that might we might want to start again? So I think that this is a job for next year, which is not something I'm going to be involved in, but I think it would be a really interesting conversation over the course of the year to see the effect that this year's change had on teachers, on students, on staff. I mean, there are all kinds of interest and on parents, perhaps, maybe getting a group of parents to talk about what they learn might be uh, a good thing to do. If I'm I'd like to along those lines, I think one of the hardest things right now is to how how do we know that the kids are learning without your classic test? Right. Like that's the hardest thing that we're trying to figure out and make sure that what the kids are learning. Um, so Helen, in terms of what what you're saying, like what are we doing now that in the future? So we're trying to um, well in physics we're starting a portfolio through a website. So we had kids build a Google website that we could share, and we're hoping that it gets richer by the end of the year. But then, but, and we give kids credit for the process and the product, but they also will have that. They'll have their grade, they'll have the credit, but they'll have that, that they can carry with them. And that's what I'm trying to, that's what we're, we're all wrestling with. Um, and I think that is but a that, really interesting thing. That's exactly one of the creative things that has come out of necessity, mm -hmm. but that is a, a valuable tool for kids to know how to do a website, to be able to maintain it. I mean, that's huge. Right. So those, that, that sort of, you know, secondary gains that one might get from the pandemic. Right. And who knows that, that hopefully, you know, the, the good parts of that will stay after the pandemic. Um, and uh, so, I, but I just, that's just a comment on, on your brilliant yeah. question. No, thank you. Okay, um, so I think what I'm hearing is um, possibly an update on the essential curriculum work in January. Um, and then I, I think maybe it, it seems like there's some continued discussion about what summer school might look like or and or next steps to provide supports or assessment. I don't know, just sort of this like possible gap filling slash summer school intervention work that we need to think about as a next step. Um, so I, you know, I'm thinking, um, Michelle, you know, I don't know what the update will be like, but maybe just sort of an update on what the work is, maybe an update on conversations that have happened between coordinators or with staff or something. Um, and then an, an update on sort of where we are at summer school. And so we can talk at, you know, who, who should be, you know, like who should plan to come. Do you have thoughts? I'm just asking um, when you're talking intervention, because uh, you know I also heard John talking intervention. Um, when you're talking intervention, are you thinking like K-12 intervention? Like 
I'm not, not just the summer school piece? I'm not sure. Cause okay. I don't know that we know that we all know the answer or that I, I think it would be helpful to know now that we'll have had some time and, you know, maybe it's a conversation we begin in January and we come back to in February, but thinking about what is our plan, you know, we're, we're grappling with trying to assess where students are at, how much they're retaining this different way of teaching and learning um, in this COVID environment. And so, you know, maybe we start with like, what are the plans for summer school? How, what's the scale of summer school? How would we determine who's invited to summer school? St stuff like that. Um, or are we, is there any thought about running like a February break or an April break, you know, booster class or tutorial? Are we going to start up a tutorial program? I don't know. There's lots of things it could look like. I don't know what the, what we think as a district is the right move, but I think that if we don't start planning for that now, A, we don't have the budget for it, and or maybe we don't even already have the budget for it, but we need to at least have a plan and we see what we can execute of the plan. And so I think we should we need to begin the conversation early so that we know what our goal is so that we can try to plan for it. Um, so I don't know, I guess it's sort of like really big and I'm not really sure who's involved in that conversation and really what level we're at. But I think just based on the questions we heard today, I think that a follow-up on where we are with the central curriculum and then sort of what's going to happen with summer school and other supports as appropriate that people are, you know, plans people have or ideas, brainstorms. Um, and then I don't know, Susan, did you, are you still there, Susan? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, are there any panel members from any of our panels that we think would be appropriate to invite in January that have important information or updates or is that information? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all of the above. I mean, first of all, I think many of you know that we've been working really, really hard on a surveillance testing program for staff. And so hopefully, if we have good news on that um, for January, that would be um, really important. Um, just, you'll, you will hear this Thursday night as well, but we're asking for a significant amount of money from advisory committee on Thursday night for this um, as part of money we don't have. Um, so I think that's, uh, it may be worth having um, panel four talk about that. I don't know if that's curriculum, although there is sort of obviously there's so much, um, there's so much overlap between the public health piece, which isn't really ventilation. I mean, it's actually about, to, you know, it's, it's actually about, you know, engaging with students um, in sort of health and well-being. So at any rate, you can let us know if, if you want that. Um, I mean, I think Michelle's been working really, really well with panel three. Um, Meg has been working really well with panels one and two. So I think, and Michelle, you've been working with panel one as well. So I think it's just important to probably look across those and pick off where are the places where they've been able to have outside in perspectives that are helpful, um, both on the educational equity side and on the teacher capacity building side um, and educational equity, including both academics and SEL. Um, to be able to kind of bring this back um, and sort of give us, again, advice as we sort of think through policies and budgets and, and all that sort of thing, because I think that's important um, ask, important for us uh, to hear. So I, I'm happy to pull that together if you want into something that's sort of concise um, in terms of a set of, you know, observations that they have. So just let me know how you want to, how you yeah, want to proceed on that. Maybe, um, I don't know if Michelle, if you and Meg want to get together and sort of because you have a lot of experience, I think particularly I'm thinking anything curriculum related because I'm assuming that anything that is panel four is going to come to full school committee. But if there's some specific curriculum related items that it would be helpful to utilize or just get an update, you know, not necessarily a long report, but to just be networking and having conversation, this could be a place for us to have that conversation and connect some dots and things like that. Um, with panels one, two, and three. If you and, and Meg want, could have a conversation and maybe get back to, to us and then Susan can help us facilitate contact or whoever can do that to have a conversation with them and invite them for a period of time. Um, I do wanna dedicate, I do wanna honor the, the service that they've given to us, to our district um, and include, you know, make sure that we're really utilizing the resources that people have um, provided to us. But I also do want to keep sort of this essential curriculum conversation going. I mean, maybe it's not an hour, maybe it's a half an hour update. I don't, I would leave that up to, to you clearly. Um, and then I, need, I really need tonight to lay the stage, but we don't need that kind of. Right, right. Coverage. So I think that, it's not all. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I, I do think the meat of what I, 
vegetarian, the, the heart of the, oh, that's <laughs> the, um, the substance of the conversation sure. in January, I think I would really like to sort of focus on like our future planning for how we're going to support students. So, uh, you know, maybe an update on essential curriculum, some substantial conversation, at least initial conversations about what we think, you know, we will do to help with these gaps, um, how we decide who's going to go and be, but, you know, like just those sort of big idea questions I think we need to answer. Um, and then perhaps um, towards the end of the meeting, we, it, I guess we need to decide if the, if the panel members coming is a January or February thing or some January, some February and what would be most appropriate. But I would really appreciate your advice with you and Meg to get feedback. And we can talk afterwards about this once we've had some time to, to think about this meeting. Um, okay, so it's time to go. I thank everybody for coming. Thank you, Anthony, for joining us. I really appreciate all your time. I know you're super busy. And so this is um, great that you were able to join us tonight. Thank you, Michelle. Same thing. Very busy. We know, we appreciate, we have such gratitude. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks you all. Great. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Thanks.